Merry-Go-Round, a special all-kids edition of Missouri Outdoors. Everybody loves birds, and I'm no exception. They're beautiful, graceful, and most of them can do something we can't. They can fly. Missouri has 398 different species, different types of birds. What an incredible diversity of avian life we have right here in Missouri. One of my favorite types of birds are called raptors, birds of prey. Today, we're visiting the Raptor Rehabilitation Project in Columbia. That's where injured birds of prey are given a new lease on life, another chance to live out their lives in the wild. It's run as a part of the veterinary school at the University of Missouri. Vet students have the opportunity to learn about these special creatures and have the opportunity to teach others about them as well. And every once in a while, there's a special day when one of these amazing birds is able to return to their homes in the wild. We're also going to take a dip with some shorebirds, dance with some prairie chickens, and take a closer look at our national symbol, the bald eagle. It's all about bird watching, birds, and the people that love them. Coming right up. Have you ever wondered what it might be like to work with an eagle, a hawk, or an owl? Well, Kristen Chafin knows. She's been working with the birds at the Raptor Rehabilitation Project, and she's offered us a tour. Come on, let's check it out. Okay, you guys, we have a bunch of hungry birds out there, and we have 13 birds that live here with us, so we have to feed them every day. And you guys know what we feed them, don't you? Mice. Right. Out in the wild, they'd eat all kinds of stuff, but here we have a big supply of little white lab mice, so that's what they eat here. So you guys are gonna help us get some mice out for them. You ready? Okay, who wants to grab some mice? You can go first. Okay, well we'll get a few here. So we'll get some mice out. Here you go, there's a mice for you. <laughs> you want a mouse? That's a small mouse, there you go. <laughs> Boy, the birds are gonna love you. They're not gonna eat it out of your hand. You're gonna put it on their perch and then they'll eat it when they're ready for it. So these are the mews, and these are where all the birds live, and each bird has its own little area where it gets to live. We have three missions to educate the public about raptors and what they are, and especially kids, and to educate ourselves as vet students and to learn more as much as we can about raptors and about wild animals. And also our primary mission is to rehabilitate and release uh, animals back into the wild. Samson's a red-tailed hawk, and you might notice that Samson only has one wing, so she's been here with us for a long time, and she just lives with one wing, and she does pretty well. So we're going to put her mouse on her perch like this, and sometimes if she's real hungry, she'll come down and get that, but I don't think she's going to today. She doesn't really want to eat with an audience today, so she's probably going to eat the minute we walk out of here. You guys want to go to the next one? Go on in there and see if you can find him. He's got a little birdhouse here inside. Here's Storm. You guys want to see him? Here you go, you can hand it to me. And we'll put his mouse up there. He was pretty excited about that. So you guys can see that uh, feeding 13 birds is kind of a big job every day. Yep. They're each housed in what we call the mews. It's a word from falconry days that just means the area, like a shed, that houses the birds. Um, so then we have the bigger areas that are the flight cages, and those are either reserved for the big birds that are gonna be here for a while, or we put the raptors from the hospital that are getting better into a flight cage, and that's where we see if they can fly. You're a hungry bird, aren't you, Squiggy? Squiggy was one that came to us when she was a baby bird. She came, was brought in to us by somebody because she was injured and she fell out of a nest. And so she kind of learned how to be a bird from uh, one of our other birds here that was a foster to her. 
The feeding is a big job, as you can see. We try to keep them in a certain weight range because it's good for their overall health and they feel better and they act better. Every day, you know, you kind of go in and check on how they're doing and we weigh out their bites and make sure that they're getting the right amount. And it gives you a chance to go in and check on them every day. I never really thought I'd get to pick up a mouse before and feed it. It was really disgusting. I didn't want to pick it up. They're just little white science mice. They kind of just pick it up with their feet and stick their mouth down and eat it. It looks kind of spooky and at first, but then once you get used to it, it doesn't seem to spook you out that much. It's a whole lot of fun. I mean, getting to interact with kids is fun. Getting to interact with the animals is fun. It's an experience that I hadn't had before I came here. While Kristen and company are dishing out another delightful meal of mice to the raptors, let's take a closer look at some of the amazing birds that enjoy Missouri's wetter habitats. They're called shorebirds. You might just be surprised at some of the birds coming to a wetlands near you. People often link wetlands with duck hunting, but bird watchers have always known that where you find water and good wetland habitat, you find birds, lots of birds. In spring, it could be pelicans. We had probably close to a thousand white pelicans migrating through the area. And I came down one Monday morning and all of a sudden it just like, it looked like it snowed pelicans. They were everywhere. In spring and early fall, a different flock moves through. Right now we're seeing a, a tremendous migration of shorebirds and there are probably 20 or 25 species of shorebirds that might migrate through our part of the country and need habitat just like ducks and geese do. And we're delighted that they're finding something to their liking here. Shorebirds in a landlocked state? Absolutely. Many shorebirds breed in the Arctic and spend their winters on sun-drenched southern beaches. In between lies Missouri's wetlands. Actually, I didn't realize we had an awful lot of shorebird use in the area, so the yellow legs and, and the rail, that's neat. We've seen several different kinds. Stuff that I wouldn't normally have seen, I don't think, because I'm here in the wintertime. Shorebird migration in Missouri runs from mid-July through November, with the peak in August. So now is the perfect time to get out and enjoy some great viewing. A newly hatched baby bird may not be the most beautiful creature in nature, but it is a wonderful thing to see. Their nests are usually very well concealed. Some nest on barren ground, some in lush habitat or grassy meadows. Others nest high in trees, in tree holes, in swamps, or even man-made birdhouses. The nesting season extends from about mid-spring through mid to late summer. Unfortunately, some of the birds at the Raptor Rehabilitation Center are permanent residents. They've been injured in a way that will never allow them to return to the wild. But they still have an important role to play as ambassadors for the rest of the natural world. Wild Missouri gets up close and personal as the staff from the Raptor Rehabilitation Project takes the birds on the road to the Columbia's Twilight Festival. Now this is a party I don't want to miss. And so we're going to go out to Twilight Festival and hopefully see a whole bunch of people and get to show the birds to lots of kids like you guys and show people what raptors are and what we do and why we need to take care of the raptors and educate people and hopefully let the kids come up and see stuff that you wouldn't normally see. You just see them flying around but this time you get to see them up close so it's pretty cool. You guys ready to go? The Twilight Festival is nice because it's something that's held once a week in June and in September. So a lot of members of the community come out um, with their children and we're able to interact with the community as a whole. Do you know what kind of bird 
this is? I'll give you a hint. Look at her tail. Red tail hawk, that's right. You see all kinds of these around here. If you look up in the sky and you see something with a real white belly, that's what you probably are seeing is a red tail hawk. A lot of people, especially some of the school children that have only been in urban areas, they've never really seen raptor up close. They don't necessarily know even what kind of bird a raptor is. So it's great for them to get up and be able to see um, from just a few feet away what the birds look like, the different colored eyes, the shape of the feathers, how the hawks and the owls differ, and um, for us to be able to tell the differences about these owls and hawks and exactly um, what their lifestyles are like out in the wild. This is Lucifer, this is our screech owl. He kind of woke him up. This isn't really his time of day, as you can imagine. Yeah, they're used to being out at night, so he's probably a little sleepy right now. <laughs> so we gotta cool him off a little bit. Gently. <laughs> you can see how that water just sits on top of him. His feathers are really waterproof. He's designed for being out in the rain, so that water just kind of beads up on him like that. The birds enjoy it, we think. Um, the children really enjoy it, and we get a lot of parents out there too asking questions, so it's great. I really think that, that if you educate people, and especially kids, about what raptors are, a lot of their parents come up to us and don't really know what kind of birds these are. And if you let them know more about them and what they're seeing around them, then I really think that that'll help them get interested in conservation and wanting to protect these guys. Unfortunately, a lot of the birds that we see at the vet school have injuries that are related to interaction with humans. A lot of them have been uh, either hit by cars or shot. So that's really our goal is that hopefully the kids will see that and we want to help prevent that. Have you ever seen birds dance? Well, they do. Well, at least it looks like dancing. These birds are an endangered resident of Missouri's tall grass prairie, and the dance, or the behavior, is called booming. We're talking about prairie chickens, and they're just amazing! This is something you've got to see for yourself. This is a prairie chicken booming ground, a piece of prairie where hens choose a mate based on who's the best dancer and which male booms the best. Because prairies are so scarce in Missouri, so are prairie chickens. Only 2,000 are left in the state. What's going on out there right now, there's several different sounds, but what the, it is, is of course the males are giving their heart out to try and track the females come out there for breeding. During March and April, the prairie chickens return to specific booming sites. These are scattered across the western third of the state, where patches of prairie remain. They come back to the same spot every year unless something happens to they they like get a house built on it or trees move into it or, or they get to where they're disturbed to the point where they don't come back. It's extremely important for the booming ground because that's the only place where courtship actually takes place. So if you disrupt the booming ground, you disrupt the males, uh, then of course they don't get bred and if they don't get bred then you have no future chickens. Legend has it that Native Americans learned to dance by watching this bird. Today in Missouri, the greater prairie chicken continues to dance on the edge of extinction. To me, nothing signifies a sense of wildness better than an owl. Look at that face, those eyes. Yeah, there's nothing wilder than an owl. Unless, of course, we're talking about Ralph Duran. <laughs> Ever hear knocking or hammering out in the forest? That would be a woodpecker, but they call too. <laughs> Is that the call of a downy woodpecker, a pileated woodpecker, a northern flicker, or a red-headed woodpecker? Here it is again. <laughs> That's the pileated woodpecker, the biggest one of all, and one of them is famous. Cartoon character Woody Woodpecker is a pileated. Well, I think that herons add a, add a lot to the outdoor experience. You can find them really throughout Missouri, and, and if you keep your eyes open on these streams, you're going to see them eventually. And to me, they 
have a little bit of a primitive quality almost. It's sort of like, especially if you see one of these colonies or rookeries as they're called, why you get sort of a, a, a sort of a hint of maybe uh, ages past. It has sort of a primitive flavor to me. Jim Wilson has spent a lot of time watching herons. For more than 25 years, he was the state's bird expert. He's now retired. But during his years with the Conservation Department, it was his responsibility to assess the health of our bird populations. And several years ago, the outlook for herons and other fish-eating predators did not look good. About 10 or 15 years ago, they started to make a comeback. Sometime previous to that, they were declining and they got to very low numbers not only in Missouri, but lots of places throughout the eastern part of the United States, probably throughout the range. A lot of people theorize that uh, they are rebounding following uh, population depressions caused by DDT. In other words, uh, something that, that feeds in, in water systems on fish is most susceptible to pesticides that run downhill and get into their prey. And then because uh, DDT was one of the persistent pesticides that could be magnified through uh, uh, the food chain, why herons were hurt by it, uh, as were cormorants, ospreys, bald eagles, and other fish-eating predators. So with the banning of DDT in 1972, we've uh, witnessed a comeback of most of these species I just mentioned, including the great blue heron. My personal opinion is that the herons in this area are on the increase. We have some new uh, rookeries uh, cropping up on some of the smaller streams, but uh, the largest one here on the Osage seems to have increased over the past several years. Tom Corey literally grew up with herons. As a boy, Tom grew up on a farm overlooking a heron rookery on the Gasconade River. Recently, Tom's moved back to the family place and has had the opportunity to assess the value of the land and the birds that live on it. Herons just seem to add another dimension to the to the fun to bird them around here, and uh, they uh, they're quite loud. And you you hear them particularly later on in the year when they really when the chicks get up, they make quite a little bit of noise. They'll just uh, things will be quiet, and all of a sudden they'll just start. I don't know what you call it, a squawk or something. It's not quite bird-like, uh, particularly in the summer. And now down here, you can just see over those trees is a is a sandbar one of the better sandbars on the river. And I'm sure that, uh, and they do this in the middle of the night, by the way, and I'm sure that you know, a lot of these campers that have camped on that thing have, uh, have wondered what in the world is coming down when, when these uh, herons take up their racket. These things, when they leave that nest, it seems to me that they know where they're going. They, they just take a heading and go straight. They, uh, they don't soar or anything, just fly kind of a straight line to wherever they're going. Wild bird fly off is the best payback, and that's just what we're going to do today. Simon is the name of the bird that we're going to release today, and Simon is a juvenile barred owl. And somebody found Simon as a baby about two months ago, and he was orphaned. He didn't have his parents around, so they brought Simon to the conservation department and brought Simon over to us. And so we took care of him, and it took about two months, but now he's doing really well, and he's not injured, and he's hunting mice on his own and he can fly and so we're really excited because now he's going to get to go out back out into the woods into the wilderness and that's really what we're all about is we're trying to get the birds healthy and back out where they belong. These birds are not going to want to just walk up to you and say here release me so we're going to have to catch them. So hopefully he stays nice and low like that. Good job. This is the part where 
we don't want him to get caught up into the net. Yeah. So I'm going to take it. Do you want to towel? Hi, Simon. Okay. That was actually went pretty well, because sometimes they can get a little tangled up. And we put a towel over his head, because that calms them down, and they don't struggle as much. We don't want him to struggle and hurt himself again. Okay, there. Hello. Simon is about four months old, we think. So he's ready to go out on his own. But when he came in, he was just a little, little fuzzball of an owl. Yeah, let's wrap him up more. So that there. Ready to go outside to be released. When you put so much effort into seeing a bird come in injured or orphaned, and working with it, feeding it, making sure that it grows, weighing it, watching every single aspect of its health and uh, maturation. It's pretty exciting to be able to see it be released, but then there's also that maternal, paternal instinct. When you see them go, you're like, oh, is it too soon? Are we doing the right thing? So what we're gonna do here, we're gonna take one of the towels off, and then I am just going to go place him down and kind of move the towel back from him and then let him go on his own so that it's as low stress for him as possible. And as you guys can see, this is a nice area. There's lots of trees here, but there's some open area too. So hopefully he can take off and fly a little ways and then have a tree to rest in and take a break and kind of reevaluate his surroundings and figure out where he wants to live from now on. good it feels like well a lot of the birds that come in their injuries are so bad that we can't release them so when we finally get to release one it's just a wonderful feeling and it really feels like we are making a difference to that bird and the species in general there he goes Yay! Wait, oh, there he goes. All right. feels really good all the hard work paid off have so much invested in it at the point that you get to release it, even if it's only been here a couple months, some of them are here for you know six months or longer. And you have so much invested in this bird and you've spent so much time with it that you know we just really hope that it goes out there and you know we're all worried about how it's gonna do tonight and, and will it find a good home and will it be able to hunt. So you know we know that we've done the best that we can and hopefully you know it'll go out there and have a really successful life. Elida, a bald eagle recovering here at the Raptor Rehabilitation Center. He was brought in with a broken wing. The wing has been repaired and the staff is working with him to get him prepared for life back in the wild. Unlike some of the permanent residents, we don't want to get too close to Elida. He needs to maintain his natural fear of humans to protect him when he re-enters the wild. Eagles are just really intense. You can see in their faces why they were chosen as our national symbol. And there are a lot more of them in Missouri than you might think. Check this out. Each fall, as areas in the north freeze, thousands of bald eagles migrate south from Canada and the Great Lakes states in search of open water. Some eagles will travel as far south as the Gulf Coast. During a recent winter, more than 2,000 bald eagles were reported in Missouri. A few are usually seen in the state by mid-fall, but most arrive in December. In some cases, a bird will return to the same location each winter. At waterfowl areas, eagles feed primarily on dead and injured waterfowl. At rivers and lakes, fish make up most of their diet. A few remain in Missouri to nest, but most begin moving back north again in late February. Eagles are one of the largest birds of prey in the world. Their life expectancy in the wild is about 30 years, while some bald eagles have lived up to 50 years in captivity. They fly 20 to 40 miles per hour in normal flight, but can reach speeds of more than 100 miles per hour while diving. Their vision is five to six times sharper than humans. It's been a great visit at Columbia's Raptor Rehabilitation Project. 
we've seen some really great birds, met some great folks, and best of all, we were able to see a bit of wild Missouri return home. I love a story with a happy ending. Birds are an amazing part of Missouri's natural heritage. If you get a chance, look up. There's a lot to see. Thanks for joining us.